Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter, Radio Detectives, and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, before we do get started, I do want to uh, thank, we, we received a listener uh, donation from John. Thanks so much for your support, John. Uh, we'll send access to this pr- uh, premium site, as we do with all donations of $7 or more. And you can support the show at support.greatdetectives.net. And uh, also, I do encourage you uh, to join with me in helping HIV AIDS orphans in India. And as I... We're doing four half marathons this fall, and you can pledge your support at heavensgate.greatdetectives.net. Now it's time for today's episode of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, The Easy Mark. I was hired to find a blackmailer, and I did. But first I found a badly beaten Adonis, a Jezebel with an accent, and a man who had been an easy mark for murder. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. And now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Easy Mark. I'd spent a dull day on a duller subject, which was don't get caught with your income tax return down at midnight, March 15th. After calling time for a thick stake designated to bolster the stamina of a private detective, but nevertheless non-deductible, I reluctantly headed back to my office where I found both my conscience and the long-form 1040 still waiting, which meant there was no way out. The dull day was going to stretch on into the night, but then I got a break, because my telephone rang and the call was from one Mrs. Corey Gilbert. A prospective client who wanted action in a hurry. Marlowe, you've got to move fast. I just found out that my husband, Ross, will be at 3806 Melrose Avenue in 20 minutes, and I know that means trouble. Well, just for size, Mrs. Gilbert, how do you spell trouble? With a capital B, as in blackmail. There's no time for details now. Just get to that address and find out who Ross is meeting with. Only hurry, Marlowe, please. Well, hurry after what, Mrs. Gilbert? I've never met your husband, remember? Oh, oh, yes. Well, he's tall, dark eyes, dark hair, very handsome. And the blackmailer, short, stocky, and repulsive, I suppose. I've never seen the blackmailer. All right, Mrs. Gilbert, where can I reach you? Well, I live at 439 and a half Ogden Drive. Ogden Drive. The phone number is Gladstone 8195. 8195. All right, Mrs. Gilbert, I'll call you. Thanks. Oh, and Marlo. Yeah? Hurry, will you? You see, I... I love my husband. I was a little more than 20 minutes finding the address on Melrose. But when I finally pulled up and parked away from the place, I figured being late didn't matter because... Number 3806 turned out to be an unfinished house, set deep in an acre of building materials. I was about to head for a telephone and get an explanation from a confused lady named Corey Gilbert when a lot of noise from what would someday be a living room changed my mind. Then I knew that my client had the right address after all, because there in the pale light of a slice of moon, taking the last of an awful beating from a thin man with a thick beard and a lot of muscle, was Ross Gilbert. Dark eyes and dark hair, like she said, but no longer very handsome. I'm almost through with you, except for this. A present from Nanette. And just one more from Nanette. That last punch stacked Ross Gilbert onto a pile of rough lumber like he was another one by twelve. And as he slowly scraped to the floor, unconscious thick beard dusted himself off lightly, jerked at his tie, and stepped out of the opening reserve for a future front door. I started over to help Ross Gilbert, but then I remembered that my client wanted to know who her husband was meeting and why, not how hard or fast he could swing. So I decided for the time being to play it quiet. When Thickbeard got into his car, I got into mine. I 
followed him all the way to Beverly Hills, where he pulled to a stop in front of the Camden Arms Court. I parked lights out and watched him strut up a flagstone walk and knock on the door of a bungalow number four, which was dark. When he knocked again and it stayed dark, he took an envelope out of his pocket, wrote something on it, and jammed it into the mailbox. Then he got back into his car and started away fast. I walked up to the bungalow and helped myself to Thickbeard's empty envelope. On one side, scrawled in pencil and smudge, was the telephone number Sunset 31676. On the other, payment delivered okay, plumber. Plumber, huh? I shoved the message into my pocket, struck a match, and started looking for a name on the front door. But then a cab pulled up, and a moment later, I had help. I can be of some assistance, perhaps? Yes, I, I was just... Oh. Uh, <laughs> Nanette? Oui. Nanette Lamarck. But I do not know you, monsieur. No. No, you don't. Do you? I, um... I think if you will stop staring and begin talking, we will do much better. Who are you? Uh, Philip Marlowe. A friend of Plummer's. He asked me to deliver a message for him. Do I go on? Of course, Mr. Marlowe. But please come inside. It is so much nicer there. <laughs> Nanette was so right about it being nicer inside. There were lights. And that made it easier to see that the lady with the thick French accent and the gorgeous waistline was something that could have mustered her own foreign legion. She was narrow green eyes and open red lips, topped by a lot of close-cropped soft brown curls that kept running into each other. And for a dress, she was wearing about a quarter of a mile of draped chiffon that, in the right places, fitted a little closer than her own skin. When I told her what I claimed had been a message from Plummer himself, she purred her thanks and started to mix me a drink. When I brought up the subject of blackmail, she stopped abruptly, spilling a bottle of perfectly good Kentucky Tavern all over the table. Blackmail? What do you mean, Mallow? Extortion, honey. The malpractice of getting a lot for knowing a little that's not nice. <laughs> You're swinging wild now, mon cher. Maybe. But if it doesn't bother you, I'll stay right with it. Because I'd like to know why you and Plummer, who have such an easy mark, insist on throwing rocks. What easy mark are you talking about? A tall, dark, and used to be a handsome guy named Ross Gilbert. Ross? Soda, Marlowe? Yeah. But don't make it too sweet, honey. I can't take it that way. Nanette will be very careful not to make it too sweet. There. Tell me, mon cher, when did you last see Plummer? Uh, before tonight, I mean. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it was at the fights over at the Legion Stadium last week. How do I get my drink? Oui, mon cher. You will get your drink in your face, you <coughs> liar! <clears throat> oh, tell me, Frenchy. Is that Pearl Handle 32 considered the very latest along the Champs-Élysées? You have lied to me, mon ami. <clears throat> you see, Plummer only arrived in Los Angeles the day before yesterday. For the first time in his life. All right, I made a mistake about seeing Plummer at the fights last week. Now, why don't you put away the gun and we'll talk about Ross Gilbert. Ross Gilbert is a man I hate with all my heart. A man I could kill right this minute. And that Marlowe goes for anyone connected with him. So now get out. Oh, without even so much as an au revoir? I reserve au revoir for my friends, Marlowe. Good night. <laughs> Marlow, Mrs. Gilbert, is Ross all right? Ross isn't here, Marlow. What happened to him? He ran into an ugly beating at that address on Melrose. Something nasty from out of town named Plummer is responsible. Ever hear of him and or an imported Jezebel called Nanette Lamarck? No, I haven't. But what about Ross? What's wrong with him? Nothing that a pound of beefsteak and enough liniment can't cure. But before we worry about Ross, Mrs. Gilbert, one more thing. It's a phone number I found on the back of an envelope that belonged to Plummer. Number is Sunset 31676. What? Somebody you know? Yes, someone I know very well. It's the telephone number of my ex-husband, Emery Marsh. Emery Marsh, huh? Fancy dress designer on Wilshire? That's right. But what's he got to do with all this? Emery only met Ross once in Mexico, a party at Ensenada. Yeah, well, look, Mrs. Gilbert, why don't we postpone collecting Ross until I find out a little more? Where does your uh, ex-husband Marsh live? In Santa Monica. But there's a good chance that he's still at his place on Wilshire. He does most of his work at night. Well, then Wilshire Boulevard's my next stop. I'll try to make it a quick one. Goodbye. Emery 
Marsh's place on Wilshire was an expensive shop with a single velvet-lined show window that was home for a beautiful mannequin wearing an evening gown that would drop at the first sneeze. And after I spent five minutes thumping on a plush leather-upholstered portal, a light finally clicked on someplace inside. And a moment later, Emery Marsh opened the door. He was tall, 45, sandy-haired, and looked less like a dress designer than I did. So after following his tweet back into an inner sanctum that was comb plywood behind Chinese modern furniture, I decided to play it almost straight. Now, Mr. Marlowe, what can I do for you? Well, it's a little too early to tell. I'm a private detective, Mr. Marsh, and I'm working for your ex-wife, Corey Gilbert. Corey? Mm-hmm. Is she in trouble, Mr. Marlowe? No, no, close to it. Tell me, Mr. Marsh, when you were last over to Nanette Lamarck's place at Camden Arms, when was that? Nanette Lamarck? Yeah. I've never heard of her. Nor a man named Plummer? Nor a man named Plummer. Who are they? Well, in the order I tossed them out, a mademoiselle with a touchy temper and a thug who needs a shave. I don't understand. How do they concern me? Well, maybe they don't. But your telephone number turned up on Plummer. Both Plummer and Nanette are tied on to a man who at this moment is probably picking himself up off the floor of an unfinished house at 3806 Melrose Avenue. His name, Mr. Marsh, is Ross Gilbert. Gilbert? Yes, that's right. What do you know about him? Well, very little. I only met him once at the Riviera Pacifico. Riviera Pacifico? The hotel at Ensenada in Mexico. Mm. Matter of fact, it was the same night that he met Corey. Which didn't make you very happy, huh? Uh, no, you've got it wrong. Corey and I were already divorced. The three of us meeting was nothing more than an accident. Oh. And when Ross and Corey parlayed that accident into marriage, were you still smiling? Better than that, Mr. Marlowe. When that happened a month ago, I was grinning. You see, until then, I had been paying Corey $1,200 a month alimony for two and a half years. Mm. And Corey gave all that up for love and Ross Gilbert, huh? Uh, Ross Gilbert isn't exactly a pauper, Mr. Marlowe. No, I guess not. Blackmailing a pauper doesn't add up. Uh, what did you say, Mr. Marlowe? I said putting the bite on somebody who has nothing is like sucking a lollipop with a cellophane on it. You get action but no results, you see. Oh. Now tell me, why does the word blackmail come home to roost, Mr. Marsh? You wouldn't happen to know who the guilty party is, would you? No, Mr. Marlowe. Mm. And what's more, if I did, I certainly wouldn't keep that sort of thing to myself. Oh, no, I don't think you would. Well, thanks anyway, Mr. Marsh. You've been a big help. I'm glad. And if I can be of any further help, don't hesitate to call on me, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, please. No, I won't, Mr. Marsh. You can depend on it. <laughs> All the way from Wilshire Boulevard to Mrs. Gilbert's place on Ogden Drive, I kept wondering who wanted how much out of Ross Gilbert and why. About 20 minutes later, when I pulled up in front of the house, I started concentrating on my client, who had to be the woman standing next to a green coupe in the driveway and waiting in double time. Corey Gilbert was long, flowing blonde hair, draped over shoulders that at the moment looked like they were carrying the weight of the world. But she was prettier worried than most women who always keep it gay. Mr. Marlowe? Yeah, Mrs. Gilbert? Yes. Your husband shown up yet? No. Marlowe, what do you suppose Take it happened? easy. Maybe we'd better have another look at uh, 3806 Melrose Avenue, huh? Whatever you say. Shall I drive? If you've got a license. Yes, Mr. Marlowe. I've got a license. Well, okay, let's go. <laughs> The way we took off in Corey's Nash, I wasn't sure whether her license was for driving a car or an airplane. And while she kept her 83 and a half AAA on the accelerator, she talked about her husband and why she was worried. By the time we were near the place, I knew all about the party in Ensenada, their whirlwind courtship, and what a fine guy Ross Gilbert was. When we got out of the car and started over the last hundred yards toward the unfinished house... I'd learned everything Corey knew about the blackmail angle, which wasn't very much. It started last week, Marla, when we got back from our honeymoon. Ross wasn't himself at all. He was worried. He forgot how to laugh. He argued with me over any and everything. Mm. Where does the blackmail come in? I don't know. He wouldn't tell me what was wrong. Then this evening, just before I called you, I overheard him talking on the telephone. That's when I caught the word blackmail and this address. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe Ross will be able to fill in a few of the blanks for us. Oh, he was over here in this room on a pile of lumber when I... Plummer must have done a lot more damage than I figured. Ross! Ross! Take it easy. Take it easy, baby. Marlowe, what is it? Is he... Is he... 
I'm afraid he is, Corey. <laughs> that man! That man! He beat him to death! No, Corey, that round hole in Gilbert's chest wasn't made by a fist. From where I stand, it looks like a thirty-two caliber bullet. In just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, for some new wrinkles in the mystery field, look on the face of Mr. Jack Benny, eminent producer of the mystery comedy The Lucky Stiff, which opened in New York today. Although Mr. Benny's stars are Dorothy L'Amour, Claire Trevor, and Brian Donlevy, Jack's face is covered with new wrinkles because he couldn't be in New York to sell the tickets himself. He's remaining in Hollywood to appear tomorrow night on CBS on The Jack Benny Show with Mary Livingston, Don Wilson, Dennis Day, Phil Harris, and Rochester. So be sure to listen. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Easy Mark. Corey Gilbert's face went sickly white, and her mouth twisted on the brink of hysteria as she stared at the dead man. I turned her away from it and led her to a window. She did the fastest job of pulling herself together I'd ever seen, and I went back to the body. On the way, I noticed a folded scrap of paper on the floor. It was a page torn out of a desk diary, but all that was written on it was the address of the unfinished house we were in. I looked down at what had once been Ross Gilbert's. Setup didn't make any sense. A victim of blackmail had been beaten up by a total stranger and then, a little while later, murdered. Somebody had killed a goose that was laying the golden eggs and it didn't figure in any direction. Well, I just about decided to go through his pockets when a sound from Corey changed my mind. <gasps> Marlo, Marlo, come here, quick. What is it, Corey? There's someone out there. I saw a shadow move. Get away from the window. Marlo, there, running. Why, it's a woman. Yeah, and quite a woman. What do you know? She's crossing the street now. Who is it, Marlowe? Who is she? Character as French as Milani's 1890. Only she's more like nitric acid than salad dressing, Corey. Her name is Nanette Lamarck. She's getting in that car. Aren't you going to stop her? No. I've got a line on Miss Lamarck. I can find her. But she was hiding here. She could be the one who shot Ross, couldn't she? Easily. In fact, right now, she's the odds-on favorite. But she's also cagey, and we'll have better luck if we get her on home ground where she'll talk. Besides, there's a big chunk of this business that doesn't follow. What do you mean? Well, look, the murder came out in reverse. Ross was paying off. So he should have been the killer instead of the corpse. Which means there's more than blackmail involved. I don't know what you're talking about. All I know is he's dead and, and, and that woman killed him. Maybe. Come on, Corey, let's get out of here. Where are we going? Well, first you take me back to my car and then I got a job for you to do. What kind of a job? Well, I found this page ripped out of a desk diary, probably Ross's. I want you to go through all his things and find that diary for me. There might be something else in it that'll give us a connection. All right. Where are you going? I'm going to pay a call on Nanette. Only this time I'm bringing my own welcome mat. I think I'll need it. After Corey dropped me off, I called Lieutenant Ibarra at Homicide, reported the body, and then I got into my own car and drove out to Beverly Hills again, to the Camden Arms Court. Nanette's bungalow had lights on. I parked down the street and made tracks back through the landscaping to a side window. Annette was playing pinup girl on the arm of a divan. as She watched someone pace back and forth across the room. When I got close enough to hear what was being said, that someone turned out to all be right, Corey Gilbert's right. first husband, People Emery Marsh. Like chickens with their heads off. So Ross Gilbert was shot to death. But I've got to know the truth about one thing, Miss Lamarck. My entire life's work is at stake. Can't you understand? Now, hide, right, Monsieur Marsh. Do not break out into tears, I will tell you. Plummer is merely a private investigator I hired to, to locate Ross Gilbert for me. Now, are you happy? No. Why did such a person have my telephone number? That's what I want to know. I'll be ruined if I'm involved in this mess. My reputation means everything to my business, and... Well, things aren't going too well just now. If I'm connected with a scandal, I'll be wiped out. Well, stop worrying. I saw you with Ross Gilbert three or four times before he disappeared. So I gave your name to Plummer as a, as a possible lead to Ross. That is all. Why did you want to find Ross Gilbert? That, mon ami, is none of your business. You found out what you wanted, so good night. All right. I'll go. But can I count on you to keep my name out of this? Listen, I am counting on me to keep my own name out of it. And I will be very busy doing that. Good night. I plastered myself up against the side of the house and watched Emery Marsh leave. 
He looked anything but happy over the result of his interview with Nanette, but I figured I had the benefit of experience to work with and less to lose than he had. So I waited until he was out of sight, and then I stepped up to the door, braced myself, and tried my luck. You again! Yeah, and I want to talk to you! Get your foot out of my door! Ow. Oh, get out of here! Get out! Not until we've had a nice, quiet chat, Nanette, and I think we'll take up where Emery Marsh left off. What? Look, just who exactly are you, Marlow? Your boy, Plummer, and I are distant fraternity brothers, but there the similarity ends. Just another chief private detective. Ooh. Okay, baby, if that tough stuff's the only language you understand, we'll talk that. Oh, stop it! Leave me alone! Now get over there! Sit down! Oh, oh you... you ape! I'd be nice to me if I were you, Nanette. Because I just love to see a rope around that lovely neck of yours. And what's more, I can almost put one there. You're in a mess right up to your accent. So start making answers beautiful and keep them straight. First, why did you put Plummer on Ross Gilbert's trail? Because he double-crossed me, that is why. Double-crossed you how? He ran away from me. He was mine, all bought and paid for, you understand? Not exactly. When I met him, he was flat broke. I bought him every decent stitch of clothes that he had. Gave him everything he needed to be a gentleman because we were going to be married. And then he ran out on me and took everything with him that he could lay his hands on. Go on. Nobody does that to Nanette Lamarck. Nobody. So you hired that licensed thug plumber to find him and beat him half to death, right? Exactly. Well, go ahead, baby. The story doesn't end there. Tell me the rest, the good part. About how you waited until Plummer got through with him, and then you went down to that unfinished blueprint out of House and Gardens and killed him. No. No, that is not true. I, I did not do that. I, I, I could not. That's no bigger lie than the rest of it. Why's that pearl handle 32 of yours, Nanette? And don't reach for it. Just tell me. What do you want with it? I want to see if it's been fired. Now, where is it? Call it, Jack. Oh, fine. Plummer. Miss Lamarck might not like for you to see her gun. Oh, I thought you would never get here. Who's this character, Miss Lamarck? Another private detective. Marlowe by name. No kidding. Well, we got a lot in common, haven't we, Jack? Yes, yes. We've each got two arms and two legs. And the name is Phil. Oh, that's the way it is, huh? Well, listen, Jack, you got no business here in the first place. For two cents, I'll chop you down. You're even cheaper than I figured. Why, and you, you can put big... away that big, nasty gun, too, because I got you cold. That envelope you stuck in Nanette's mailbox tonight had a slip of paper inside from one of your old clients. Huh? Well, what, are you, what are you talking about? Can't you guess? Hey, you want to see it? Well, yeah, yeah, let's have a look at that. Okay. Take a good look. Oh, 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 oh. Come on, drop the gun, Plummer. Come on, drop it. My arm! All right, now, fold up. Oh. There's your bargain basement detective, Nanette. You didn't get your money's worth, did you? Now, shall we take a look at that pearl-handled gun of yours? It is over there in my bag. Thanks. Mm. Clips full and that smell sure isn't gunpowder. Of course not. I did not kill Ross. Why, I was not even inside of that building where he was. Yeah, I know, but you... Wait a minute. Say that again. I said I was never inside that unfinished house where he was found. When I drove up, you were already there, so I left. Yeah, yeah, I know. And Plummer's gun is... Uh-huh. Fully loaded. Hasn't been fired either. Baby, you've just given me a great idea. An idea? But I do not understand. Yeah, never mind, I'll explain it to you later. And incidentally, you better be around. Right now, I've got to find out one more thing, and then maybe I'll pop this whole shebang wide open. <laughs> Mr. Marlowe. Good evening, Mr. Marsh. Lucky to find you're still working, huh? Late hours are a habit with me these days. Come in. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Marsh, I've come back for that help you offered me earlier this evening. I see. Well, the offer's still good. Fine. I think your ex-wife, Corey, is lying to me. She claims you didn't know Ross Gilbert, that you only met him once at that party in Ensenada, but you did know him, didn't you? Why, Yes. As a matter of fact, I did get acquainted with Ross slightly. We had dinner together a few times. Uh-huh. And you really did favor his marriage to Corey because it freed you automatically from that alimony load you were carrying. That's correct, Marlowe. But I don't And see... it's also correct, isn't it, that you couldn't afford to go to court to have your alimony reduced because that would let your snobbish clientele know you were going on the rocks. Yes, that's also true. And maybe it's true that you actually engineered the marriage and it backfired on you. Very smart, Mr. Marlowe. Just keep your hands at your side. This might go off. Yeah, oh, yes. Well, I expected a reaction, but not quite so soon. Too bad. I'll trouble you for your gun, now that you've got it all figured out. 
Yes, Marlow. I engineered that marriage. Corey was attracted to Gilbert, but he was broke. I knew that would scare Corey off if she found out. So you and Corey made a deal, particularly with Ross. He wanted to marry Corey. You supplied the cash for his courtship, right? Yes. Only he wouldn't stop there. He kept demanding more. Sure, it figured from the start. Ross wasn't being blackmailed. He was the blackmailer himself, and that made you worse off than before, so you killed him. You're so right, Mr. Marlowe. And remember, the price for two murders is the same as for one. So you've really left me no alternative. I'll give you an alternative, what? Emery. <laughs> Corey! One thing you didn't count on. I really loved Ross Gilbert. <laughs> Well, I guess that winds it up, Corey. Emery's in the hospital, and Nanette and Plummer are both in the clink. Too bad I only hit Emery in the hand. I never could trust my aim. It's always been bad, in a lot of ways. It was good enough tonight, baby. Lucky for me you showed up when you did. Say, what made you come to Marsha's place, anyway? Well, that page from the desk diary paid off, Marlo. Only we made a mistake. Huh? It didn't come from Ross's diary. It came from Emery's. I finally remembered his handwriting. Mm-hmm. Now, you tell me something, Marlo. Yeah. How did you know Emery was guilty? Oh, well, he made the oldest slip in the book. When he was talking to Nanette, I overheard him say that Ross had been shot. Oh. Emery had no way of knowing that Gilbert was dead or how he'd been killed unless Nanette told him. And for a while, I thought she had, but then I found out that she couldn't have because she'd never been inside the house where we found Ross. So it had to be Emery. Sure. I see. Well, Marlo, uh... What does a gal say at the end of a night like this? Thanks or something? Just thanks will be enough. <laughs> I got to do my income tax. Can I give you a lift? No. No, I'll walk a while. I've got some thinking to do about marksmanship. But call me sometime later on, will you? Just to see if I'm shooting in the right direction. You can count on it, Corey. Thanks. Good night, Phil. <laughs> I watched her for a moment as she walked down the street all by herself, deep in her own thoughts, and it looked to me like she was playing it strictly square. I almost wanted to follow her. <laughs> the first time in a long time, I felt like I wanted to get to know a client better. But March 15th can slip up awfully fast, and that long-form 1040 was still unfinished and waiting for me in my office. So I decided to go back and work on my income tax and play it strictly square, too. After all, that's really the easiest way in the long run. Yeah, I keep telling myself. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced by Norman MacDonald. The script by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt was directed by Ralph Rose. Featured in the cast were Sylvia Sims, Lorette Philbrandt, Ken Harvey, and Paul Duboff. The special music was by Richard O'Runt. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... There was a man with a bad heart, a telephone number scribbled on a cash register receipt, and a corpse on the other side of town. But I couldn't see the connection between them until I realized they were all tied together by the same long rope. Worth thirty thousand dollars. Next Wednesday evening, February 2nd, CBS will bring you a moving, powerful drama of a reporter who took an assignment he eagerly sought, only to find it came too close to home. Its title is Mind in the Shadow. Its star is Eddie Albert, and its story tells how the reporter set out to reveal the shocking facts about our mental hospitals and then learned that his lovely young wife might have to enter one. Based on actual documentary evidence of conditions existing today, you'll find Mind in the Shadow, a revealing story of something which could happen to you. Hear Mind in the Shadow, starring Eddie Albert, next Wednesday evening, over most of the same CBS network stations. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations.
This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS. Jack Benny's new address, Sunday night on CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. A nice uh, twist mystery here. Um, I think this one definitely was... Uh, very engaging, uh, when you're dealing with, uh, what looks like, as Marlowe said, looks like things happen backwards. Um, the Marlowe, uh, works it out so that, uh, it does make sense in the end. Uh, all right. And, uh, now we do turn to some listener comments and feedback. Jackie, the, e- uh, listener who emailed yesterday about their, uh, old time uh, radio collection there was an additional question uh, that i neglected to read i didn't realize i hadn't tell i'd finished a recording jackie said would you ever consider adding tales of the texas rangers program to your show it does c- classify it as a western and or adventure but it really is a wonderful detective show that starred joel mccray well thanks so much for the question jackie and i do intend to add it. However, it will be on Saturday in place of Dragnet. So, uh, we're about six years away from, um, playing it. Um, plus I think we do, uh, we would do a uh, T-Man in between, but that's only, we've only have two episodes of that show in existence as of now. Uh, I'd recommend checking out, uh, old time radio, uh, westerns, Andrew Ryan's otrwesterns.com. Because six years can be a little ways to wait. But, uh, yeah, that is on my list to eventually do. Christina emails in from uh, Arizona, says, Hi, Mr. Graham. I hope you're great detect. I love your uh, great detectives of old time radio podcast. Johnny Dollar and Rogue's Gallery are among my favorites. Your commentaries at the beginning and the end of each show are truly informative. I was wondering if you ever considered adding the complete Richard Diamond private detective to your awesome podcast. Thank you uh, for your time and fantastic shows. Well, Christine, I, I have and I do plan on it, and it will be a little bit sooner than we get to Tales of the Texas Rangers. I actually have uh, Richard Diamond penciled in to uh, replace the adventures of Philip Marlowe once that's done. But since we just started Philip Marlowe, you've still got mm, a little less than two years to go. And uh, then we'll be over to uh, Richard Diamond. So thanks so much for the question. And uh, you can take a look at a list of all the shows we do intend to do at biglist.greatdetectives.net. And uh, that'll give you an idea of, of uh, what we've got planned. Quite a few shows. I uh, don't know uh, time frames on all or even most of them. But uh, we definitely want to get to uh, most of the uh, really uh, interesting programs out there. At any rate, that'll do it for today. We'll be back uh, tomorrow with Nick Carter. Next Wednesday, another episode of Philip Marlowe. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter, Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.